stay back at work after being gone for two months. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> we'll pray for you. Yeah, yeah. Please. Yeah. I probably could really use the extra prayers because, you know, my, the students I work with really like structure and routine and that hasn't happened the last couple of months. So. Um, for announcements today, women's Bible study. The ladies are studying from a book by Elizabeth George titled Breaking the Worry Habit Forever. And we'll be looking at the first half of chapter two, titled More Month, More Month Than Money. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> I, I want to read that chapter. <laughs> the ladies normally meet at 1 p.m. on Tuesdays in the adult Sunday school room. Men's fellowship and prayer Wednesdays at 6.30 a.m., also in the adult Sunday school room. Wednesday night study is um, at 7 p.m regularly and that's in the sanctuary this study is from david jeremiah's study on the book of philippians count it all joy this will be the last video from his series um, there'll be a discussion the following week and discussions for the next study series are still ongoing we will update you as information becomes available there is a board meeting for those of you who attend board meetings this tuesday april 2nd at 6 30 p.m um, today after church, we have an Easter egg hunt um, scheduled, and I will have the kids. I have a couple of adults that will meet kids right outside the right outside the doors, so that you can get additional direction before we let you loose. <laughs> <laughs> and if you two are the only ones here, oh wow! <laughs> I hope you brought a big bag. <laughs> There's a few more coming after church. Okay. All right. So you'll have some competition besides just the rest. <laughs> um, so media devices, please mute or turn them off, any cell phones or other devices, so that we can fully engage in worship and learning without interruption. Thank you very much. And I'll just, I just want to prepare us for worship today. And Lord, I pray that you prepare not only our hearts, but our minds, our ears, for what it is that you would have us hear from you today, Lord. And I just 
ask that we feel that, that your divine presence is here during today's services. And let us just celebrate the fact that indeed you are risen. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <coughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. All right. Our next hymn is 233, The Old Rugged Cross, and it's verses 1, 3, and 4, and I'll try to get it right this time. <laughs>
Um, we did a last minute change. So our next song is going to be 262, He Lives. Okay. And we're going to do all of these. <laughs> Other something else that we I, wait, did you get the lyrics? No, okay. Um, so, no. yeah, your hymnal okay. 262. Um, okay. 262. Um, opportunity to come and praise you and just thank you for offering your son as a sacrifice for our sins. And I would just pray for these tithes and offerings today that you would just use them um, for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Um, while they're taking offering, I'm going to do a special. Um, many of you will know it. It's called El Shaddai. Um, El Shaddai is a name God referred to himself as. Um, original, the first record of that is in Genesis 17 when the Lord comes to Abraham and promises that he will be the father of a grand nation. Um, El Shaddai means all-sufficient, almighty God. <laughs> Hey. 
See, that's why I don't get up and sing that. Was so uh, Richard, I gotta let you know, you gotta be careful. She's picking anybody out of the audience, it looks like. I don't know if you guys know this, but Richard used to sing at the First Church of the Nazarene on the choir there. And so it was nice seeing everybody just together, just proclaiming his word and just shouting out. And I could hear him back there. It was just exciting uh, when I heard that. Um, also, it's just, I, I praise God for this beautiful weather. Me and Vicki were gone all week, and we kind of liked the stormy weather, um, but we didn't see that much sun. It was mainly rain pounding against our window. And so seeing the last couple of days of sun and uh, uh, being able to turn the heaters down and watching that so you guys don't fall asleep, it's been a challenge. <laughs> um, today we're starting our uh, new series from Easter to Pentecost on the cycle of resurgence. And um, the whole focus will be blessing our community. Now, a definition of the word resurgent is a rising again into life, activity, or prominence. And it's also a resurgence of interest. And so as we as a church and a denomination look at our part of continual growth through this resurgence, we enter into a cycle of resurgence, which helps us continue the process to keep refreshing ourselves over and over and over again until the Lord comes again. Our title has everything to do with our remembrance of what Jesus did on the cross at his resurrection, because Jesus is the greatest hero of all. And we're not talking about Superman. We're not talking about Batman. We're talking about the one and only in the universe that is unbeatable. We will also be discussing some scriptures today, and, and uh, for your reference, the scriptures will be on the screen, but then not all of them will be. And I encourage you um, to take notes so you can study these scriptures at home and learn them on your own and, and see where they're coming from. Uh, one particular scripture that the whole series of this sermon is based on is Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for, mon for many. Now, we heard you earlier say, he is risen indeed, when, everybody, when they said, Christ is risen. And so when you say, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed, you're resounding like a gong, and you're celebrating that all over this particular weekend with other Christians across the globe, that he is indeed risen. And we keep repeating this because it's the same thing that happened that very first Easter morning almost 2,000 years ago. Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. Just think of that. Every generation of Christians since the first church has been shouting that particular truth. The miracle of Jesus' resurrection sets Christianity apart from other world religions. You can go to the grave of Muhammad. You can even visit the place where the ashes of Buddha are located. You cannot revisit the remains of Jesus of Nazarene, and if you try, you only find an empty tomb, because he is indeed risen from the dead. Hallelujah. The New Testament Gospels and Acts chapter 1 show that more than 500 eyewitnesses are said to have seen the resurrected Jesus. That's more than a handful. That's more than a dozen. That's, 100, that's 500 people. And think of how many witnesses 500 is. Now, compare that to how many people are maybe seated in here today. There's about 35 to 40 people. So times that by 12 or 13, and that's 500. At any rate, that's how many people got to see Jesus resurrected. It was verified, um, and it was a miracle that no one could deny. And we celebrate that miracle today. The first witnesses of Jesus' re resurrection were surprised, though. On the first Easter money, money, money excuse me, <laughs> said money earlier, so now it's like in my mind. First Easter morning, on the third day of, after Jesus had been crucified and buried, the angel had told the women who came to the tomb, he is not there. He has risen, just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. And that was in Matthew 28, 6 through 7, which indeed it says that. He is not here, for he has risen. Just as he has said, come see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, 
He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Imagine how those women felt as they approached the tomb. We learn the names of the three women in Mark 16, 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so they might go anoint Jesus' body. A fourth is identified by Luke as Joanna in Luke 24, 10. Now, as those four women approached the tomb, they must have wondered how they would be able to move the massive stone that had been placed over the entrance. Maybe they thought all four of them together could move it. They had no idea that Jesus would not be there. Even though Jesus predicted his death and resurrection, at least four on four, four occasions they did not expect a resurrection. They were expecting to embalm his body. Think about how Mary Magdalene must have felt. Mark 16, 9 claims that Jesus cast out seven demons out of her body. We are not told what torment the demons caused her, but we do know she was a loyal follower of Jesus. She witnessed his death and burial, and now she wanted to pay her respects by embalming his body. Joanna was the wife of one of Herod's officials named Chusa. He was a steward put in charge of Herod's possessions. This means that he was likely wealthy, and Luke 8.3 tells us that Joanna used her husband's good salary to support the ministry of Jesus. She was also one of Jesus' loyal followers, and she too wanted to mourn and pay her respects. Salome was the mother of two famous disciples, James and John, who were nicknamed the Sons of Thunder, and we're not talking about Thor here. <laughs> Salome had previously asked Jesus to grant her sons the right to sit on the thrones on each side of Jesus when he established his kingdom in Matthew 20, 20 through 24. You see, many thought Jesus would lead a military type rebellion to overthrow the Roman government and establish the throne of King David. Now imagine how disillusioned Salome must have seen Jesus hanging on a cross rather than sitting on a throne. She might have even thought what would happen to her two sons. Would they also be crucified? The fourth woman was also named Mary, and she was distinguished from Mary Magdalene as Mary, the mother of James in Mark 16.1, or Mary, the mother of James and Joseph in Matthew 27.56. In Matthew 28, he simply calls her the other Mary in verse 1. But one thing we can assume is that the first readers of the Gospels knew who this Mary was, as well as her sons, but that information had been lost to antiquity. We simply do not know much about her, but Jesus knew her because she was one of the group of women disciples who followed him, listened to his teachings, and seen his miracles. This group of four women arose on a Sunday morning to show their respects for the hero who had met this tragic and unexpected end. They were almost definitely disappointed and disillusioned. The very like, they very likely thought he was going to overthrow the Romans. Instead, he was killed and buried, along with their hope. All they could do was come and pay their respects by bomb, embalming his dead body with more spices. Now, have you ever been disappointed in Jesus? Maybe today you believe he was not done what you thought he should do. Maybe you feel he has let you down because you expected a different outcome. If we, are, if we are all honest with ourselves, I think we have all probably been disappointed in Jesus at some point. That may not be something we feel comfortable in saying in church, but it is honest. God doesn't always answer our prayers the way we want. He's not always open to the doors we desire or lead us where we want to go. The women probably felt that way on their way to the tomb. Maybe you feel it today. Imagine the shock of the women, though, when the angel greeted them at the tomb. Jesus had not done what they hoped in the way they wanted him to, but now, now they hear Jesus has risen. Their grief for the dead hero suddenly turns to shock. 
What is this turn of events? Jesus has risen just as he said he would. That body no longer needed their embalming services because Jesus was alive. In the end, Jesus did so much more than they expected. He defeated the greatest enemy of all. Not a Roman emperor, not a heretical Judean king, but death itself. He reserved death and turned everything upside down. Now there are three ways that Jesus was a hero. And the first of these is, Jesus was a hero because he conquered death with his resurrection. The resurrection proved that Jesus was the Son of God because he predicted both his death and his resurrection. Now, many people have predicted their own death. Even doctors can do that for us. Every human dies, but only the divine Son of God could have predicted his death and his resurrection. Now, we all admire stories about heroes who put themselves out there and risk their lives for somebody. It could be a police officer who stops a murderer or a firefighter who goes into a blazing building to rescue somebody from their own death. We all admire some way, somebody who uh, heroically puts their own safety at risk for the benefit of others. And for those people, we call them heroes. Heroes are admired for the courage to do something beneficial for others. May, they may even give their lives, such as a World War II hero who jumped on a hand grenade just to protect his other comrades in battle. Jesus was a hero because he gave his life for us. In that verse we read at the beginning of this message in Mark 10, 45, Jesus said, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now Jesus was talking about the ransom paid by his death to release us from the power, penalty, and guilt of sin. We no longer have to live under that guilt and shame. We all know what guilt feels like. We all know what sin feels like. Romans 3.23 tells us, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If I can demonstrate something here for you without knocking over the whole podium as I tend to do on such things. <laughs> <clears throat> if you can picture this for a second, this dark, dismal blanket just completely covering me, we can call this blanket guilt. It's not meant to keep us warm. Because any time we feel guilt and shame or kind of cold and shivering, even with a blanket on, <clears throat> guilt wraps us up in fear. And, and that fear is humiliation. That fear is judgment. Now, if we just remove the blanket for a second, and we take it, and we place it at the cross, it acts as a symbol of Jesus, paying the ransom for our sins. <clears throat> and if we just leave it there, that's what happens. He removes that guilt and fear. Now, what he does, though, is he puts his own blanket on us. See, I know Karen booby trapped me. <clears throat> uh, this blanket, it's red. It's just like the blood of Jesus. And it was used to atone for our sins. It symbolizes how God's perfect love surrounds us. And it ins insulates us from the fear of judgment. We all have sinned. And we all know that sin leads us to the fear of discovery. We are afraid of being found out and humiliated. We fear judgment and condemnation from others and from God. However, Jesus does not want us to live under fear of condemnation. Jesus, Jesus came to release us from the bondage and wrap us in his forgiveness and his love. 1 John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. Jesus wants to live wrapped in his perfect love with no fear of judgment, because he has already paid the price for us. If Jesus paid the price for our sin and undoes its internal consequence for our death, then we need not to fear sin or hide from guilt whatsoever. 
The sting of death is removed, and we can live in the freedom that love provides. Now, the second radical thing that Jesus did to teach us was he was a hero because of his radical teachings. Jesus taught about radical spiritual transformation that he was going to offer to us. This transformation would implant God's divine nature of love with each believer. Jesus taught three distinct ways to live. And the first of those was an easier way. Matthew 11, 28 through 30 says this, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and you will learn from me, for I am a gentle and humble heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And if you're like me, I didn't grow up on a farm, and so things that are said in the Bible sometimes don't take in a deep meaning until I really research it and look at it and see what it is. And I've always heard about this yoke, and I'm thinking egg, you know, <laughs> baby chicken. And I'm going, how does that do anything for me? But Jesus, you know, he's talking to kind of an agricultural society here, and he's talking about his yoke. And it helped people understand that by describing some kind of piece of farm equipment, um, a yoke is something that was used on oxen to bind them to heavy, plow, heavy plows. And so a modern example for a yoke for us might be even running on a treadmill of life or putting your nose to the grindstone of work. That it might be a yoke for us. Jesus used the illustration of a yoke to teach how his new way of religion would be easier and lighter than the current requirements of the Hebrew religion. This new religion would be grounded in a relationship with him. He bears the tremendous burden and helps us live out God's desires for our lives. Now still under the same section of being a hero because of his radical teachings, the second way that Jesus taught uh, was a simpler way. Now Jesus' teaching simplified all of the 613 rules and regulations from the law of Moses into two simple principles. He called them the greatest commandments. And Matthew 22 said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And that was one. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. These two great commandments are often summarized for us today as love God, love people. There's even a song out there that I really like that just that's just how it's put. Love God and love people. Now the third way that Jesus radically taught was a new, a new living way. Jesus' teaching was a sharp departure from the current way of living under the burden of strict obedience to the rules of the Mosaic law. Hebrews 10, 19 through 20 says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. This new and living way was a path that was full of life. Jesus promised that he came for the purpose of a bringing abundant living. John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. To put it simply, Jesus was the hero because his radical teaching brought an easier way, a simpler way, and a new way to live. Now, the third reason Jesus was a hero because he served the needs of others. True heroes are not in it for themselves. They serve others. Jesus lived his life in service to others. He lived his life doing courageous things that benefit others. He went to places where others didn't go. He helped people whom others overlooked. He fed people. He touched and healed the untouchable. He gave hope to people experiencing poverty. He fought corruption. He protected the helpless. And Jesus was a hero because he engaged with and served others. So over the next few weeks from now to Pentecost, we will be learning about how Jesus became a hero by engaging with others 
in his community and wherever he went. We will also learn how to follow his example and become heroes ourselves. <clears throat> the truth about following Jesus is you too can be a hero. Isn't that kind of neat? Jesus said that to the disciples that they would do more than he did. Once the power of Jesus has transformed us, we have experienced his indwelling, his sanctifying presence, and we begin to think and act differently. <coughs> Instead of our thoughts and concerns only focusing on ourselves, we become more concerned about others. The indwelling spirit of Jesus causes us to want to love God and to love people just as he did in his earthly ministry. And in our day and age, we so need Jesus to help guide us in that because our world is so distorted on what love really is that if people would just take the time to focus on Jesus, they'll learn what love is, true love. Instead of avoid, avoiding others, we begin to engage with others in our community as Jesus engaged with his community. When we engage with others by reaching out to help them, we become heroes, just like Jesus was. He did not just talk about engaging with the needs of others. He took action. As a church, we are to reflect collectively the heart of Jesus to engage with outsiders. We are not merely met with our own needs, but we are to reach out like heroes do to meet the needs of the people outside of the church. For the next few weeks, again, from Easter until Pentecost, we'll explore on how to be heroes just like Jesus was a hero. We will learn how to love courageously as Jesus loved and boldly engage our communities in acts of service and love. You know, when I think about going to serve others and blessing our community and what Jesus meant to us by dying on the cross and rising on the third day, he empowers us so much by just the fact of what he did. If we ask him into our lives, he leads us on how to bless our community. There are so much things that we do as a church to bless people and how much more he wants us to still do. I just sometimes go, boy, I don't know if I can do it. I honestly think that sometimes. How much more can I do? Do I even have enough steam left in the ship? Well, he gives us a whole New Testament full of people who did it. And he says, you can be even stronger than they are because I empower you this way. You are mine. When you accept Jesus into your life, he says, you are mine. You are like my child. And if you just hang on to me, nothing can defeat you. And today I want to take communion again. And I know that there's a certain regulation that the scripture says that if your heart isn't right with God, that all I have to do to partake in communion is to get right with God. All you have to do is pray to him. 1 Corinthians 11 said, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. And so as I go to prayer, I want to pray a prayer for you if you've not come to the point where you've accepted to Jesus yet, that you can do that, that you can accept what he has for you, you can give it all to him. It's like the blanket. I just laid it at the foot of the cross and I left it there. You might say easier said than done. No, it's a lifelong journey. I'm a byproduct of a lifelong journey of first giving my life to Jesus, but then sticking with him so he can build me up and encourage me. From living on the streets to standing here in front of you today, sober over seven years, that's what Jesus did for me. And I tell you, he can do that for you. And sometimes I have to come in here daily and give it over to him because maybe something I said. Maybe it's something I never said, but I thought or felt. And that's what Jesus did for us on the cross. He spilled his blood so we have the opportunity at any time to go to him with anything we have and live a life of serving him so we can serve others and have the delight and seeing the joy of seeing others come to Christ. We have the community Good Friday service um, and we've seen some people come to Christ. We've seen one lady healed from not being able to walk. 
We've just seen so many people, many churches together, singing together for one cause. In fact, when I was walking off the stage, one of the worship team leaders goes, boy, wouldn't this just be awesome if this was like the first church where there was no division. We were just all singing one voice for the cause of Jesus. And it's just, it just really touched my heart. So I'd like to go to prayer, and then we'll partake in communion together. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for this lovely weather in this building that protects us from the elements. But most of all, on the day of remembrance, thank you, Lord, for dying for our sins. There's so much things that, Lord, we're just not worthy of. That's how the world wants to make us feel, that, that guilt and shame that you're we were talking about today just indwells in us. It's like a whole bunch of barbed wire just dug deep in our skin. The thing is, though, that you show us that through your own sufferings that you've suffered like we did, but you also died so we can be free of those kind of things. You've also shown us that through your divine presence, through your divine touch, that we can be healed from such things. We know that it is so important for us to partake in your blessing, to take in what you have for us, your grace and your salvation, that we have to come to you and acknowledge you. We have to first understand that if we have sinned, to bring it in front of you and say, Lord, I have sinned. I have done some wrong against you. I've done some wrong against my sisters and brothers. I ask for forgiveness, Lord. And as you approach him and you go to him, you can say, Lord Jesus, I understand that you came down and walked with us, incarnate as a, as a human being, but you suffered and you went to a Christ. You were crucified and you died physically there. But on the third day you rose again, which is what we're celebrating today. And we know you sit at the right hand of God and that you save us if all we have to do is believe in you and acknowledge you as Lord and Savior. So Lord, we acknowledge you today as Lord and Savior. Come and fill our lives. Come sanctify our lives, Lord. Make us a new creation. If we've accepted you before, Lord, I ask for a renewal. I ask for continual recycle of resurgence in our life, in our, in our homes, in our churches, in our schools, and, and just across our whole community, Lord. Help us to learn to bless people. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, God. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> May I ask the ushers to come forward, please. They'll deliver the elements up to you guys.
It's interesting when you think about what Jesus was asking uh, before he went to the cross in, in a way to remember him. Because if we look at the cross and what he did, his body was broken, his blood was shed. But he wants us to focus on that, the sacrifice that he made so that we can have this new life, that we can spread this new life and joy to our community and our peoples. And that's why he asks us to remember often of what he had done for us. Luke 22, 19 says, And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten and saying, this, is my, th this cup is poured out for you. It's my new covenant in my blood. Now this journey to become a church of heroes begins with this transformation. Most heroes are not born that way. They're born average Joes or average Janes. <laughs> they become heroes through some kind of form, tra form of transformation, though. And Jesus offers you a transformation that will change your life from the inside out. And the take and the takeaway I would like you to think about this week is our hero calls us to engage in a new life. I have a lyric video for you that you guys have heard before. It's the newer version of Amazing Grace but I just can't help but think about that grace that he gave for us on that day on the cross and how my chains have been broken because of that grace. <clears throat> uh, Vicki will come up with a final prayer for you guys and uh, uh, I'll be out there with a bag waiting for the kiddos to get going on the Easter egg hunt. So. Bless you guys.
to deliver the benediction today. I just had an epiphany, and this is my own ability or need to visualize things. I, you know, I've Easter's about him spilling his blood for us, and I just had a visual of when Greg put his sin in front at the foot of the cross, and I had an imagining in my head that had Christ been on the cross when I did that, it literally, my sins would be covered in his blood. Yeah. Like literally yes. yeah. would be covered in his blood. And for me, it wasn't something I had visualized like that before. So I felt like I needed to share. Praise God for your revelation. And I have a benediction for you. As you go out into God's world this week, be Easter people. Be those who say, why do you look for the living among the dead? Jesus is not here, he is risen. Be ready to be surprised with what God will do next. Look for the risen Christ in those you meet. Let the Holy Spirit nudge you and guide you. The tomb is empty because Jesus is out in the world and now we must go out into the world too. May the joy and wonder of that first Easter morning live in your hearts today and every day. Amen.